Well, uh, hello again, everybody. Uh, we're uh, really honored to have a, a very interesting panel today that's going to be talking about uh, platforms, uh, choosing platforms, and uh, the spread of uh, iGaming and sports betting in the U.S. We have Jonathan Dubele from uh, Playtech and Matt Cullen from uh, Bet Parks uh, to talk to us today. Let me just uh, lay a little groundwork for this. So it was only about 11 years ago that we had Black Friday here in the U.S., where the government shut down uh, all the gray market operators, or at least tried to do so. Uh, I remember at least one of them ended up in jail uh, when he uh, changed planes in the U.S. Short while, uh, while ignoring the rules. Uh, iGaming was legalized two years later uh, in three states. There is only seven now that are still doing it, that are doing it. Uh, in 2018, before PASPA, iGaming was $300 million of uh, GGR. Uh, now we've got 27 states that are <coughs> operating sports betting. We have uh, $56 billion in handle in 2021. Uh, and New York has already had $4.5 billion in handle. Uh, iGaming rose to $3.7 billion of GGR in 2021, and the tax rates, and here's what's interesting, range from about 6% to about 50%. Uh, so state by state, it really varies a lot. Uh, some states have as few as one operator and as many as 25. Uh, some states give licenses to just casino operators, uh, and some have opened it up to all digital operators, including racing and sports. Jonathan, you're coming into this market, or you've been in this market now for a while, uh, offering your B2B products. Playtech is probably some of the best products in the world uh, by far. Tell me, how are you uh, negotiating this market? Where do you see the opportunities? What's different? What makes one better than another? I'll just address one thing, and the introduction was that we're going to be talking about Playtech. This, this shouldn't be about Playtech, but I'll, I'll talk about uh, iGaming proliferation in general. This specific question, though, being Playtech, uh, we, let's say, we, we started off about two years ago in the U.S. Uh, I was actually employee number one here. I've um, been with the company for some time, but we, you know, we didn't jump at things in 2013 when New Jersey uh, legalized iGaming. Uh, just, you know, not, not much there for us. Uh, it wasn't really a worthwhile investment at the time. Uh, fast forward a few years, uh, and... You mentioned uh, somewhat later, perhaps early. I like to think of it as early. Um, you know, it, we've, had it, we've had enough time pass that we've seen the cracks emerge in different uh, suppliers, operators alike. Um, we've also seen, you know, very ambitious moves. Uh, you know, certain operators trying to uh, get live as fast as possible across the entire United States, uh, only to be basically uh, sold off part and parcel uh, thereafter. Um, and then on the supplier side, um, a lot of them have been snapped up. Uh, not to say that we couldn't have been one of those. Um, in fact, it could very well happen one of these days. Uh, but uh, aside from being snapped up, uh, a lot of those are, are really stretched to their, to their extent. The race to, as a B2B supplier to provide uh, software across, across 20 states, for example, I'm not even mentioning the 30 states, but 20 states, and keep up with your customer and, and their trajectory and keep up with multiple customers and their trajectories is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And one of the things that Playtech actually, you know, what we learned from is don't stretch yourself thin. We're a gigantic company, uh, relatively speaking. We're upwards of 6,000 employees, actually 200 in the U.S. today. Uh, but one thing we didn't want to do is deploy our platform uh, across, again, 20, 30 states within a short period of time. Not only would that be not, it wouldn't be uh, profitable. Um, you know, it could, even with a company our size, could stretch our constraints. So here we are, our main focus is choosing key partners. I'm sitting beside one right now, uh, deploying our platform in strategic uh, in strategic states uh, at given times, and moreover, looking at the iGaming market in general. Uh, iGaming is what motivates us. Sports betting is obviously within our portfolio. Uh, we will be rolling out sports betting with a few operators, but again, um, you know, you've got content suppliers out there who have you know maybe 15, 20 games, and they're doing tremendously well. Uh, we have a portfolio of 700 games. Um, so we're really excited to get our content out there, pick and procure the best titles from that, and basically look at states based upon, hey, is it going to be an iGaming state? Is it an iGaming state? Is it a sports betting state that has poten uh, tremendous potential? Um, and, and go from there. So that's really Playtech in a nutshell in terms of how we've rolled out. And I'm 
very happy with our progress thus far. I don't think we've been too quick, and I also don't think we've been too slow. Yeah, we're really, uh, we're, we're barely in the first inning as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Matt, um, let's stay with this state-by-state -state rollout. Uh, you're in, you, Parks is in Pennsylvania, you're one of the leaders in that state. Tell us about how you're looking at the rest of the country. Where do you see the opportunities for a company like yours? How do you expect to compete with uh, the larger players? Um, tactful expansion is what we try and do. Um, very guarded and conservative with our approach to expansion. Uh, we're in three states right now, New Jersey, PA, and Michigan. We've got about five other states that we'll be launching in the remainder of this year. And we continue to look at other states, but it has to make sense from license fees to the partnership structure to go in um, and partner with an incumbent that, that could be a licensee or the, the skins model, it just depends. Um, and of course, the tax rate. Um, and when we were uh, looking to make a switch of our platform, uh, we started that process 18 months ago, hard to believe. Finally finished it about six weeks ago. Um, it was a daunting process. But um, we needed something that we could scale across multiple states quickly, and um, we think we found that partner. What, what go, actually, that's very interesting, because I've heard uh, companies switching platforms, adopting platforms. There was a lot of talk about you had to be in early, uh, but I've talked to countless operators who have been thinking of switching or have switched. What's, what's, um, what are you looking for uh, now that you're a more mature company, what are you looking for uh, in your platform provider? And why not build your own platform like some others or, or, or purchase, a, a purchase a platform? We company? thought a lot about that. Why not buy Playtech? Well, we thought a lot about you know, all different kinds of options. We looked at well over two dozen options, buy versus build versus partner. And we wanted to focus on growth. We knew we were going we to go out into multiple states. Initially, our, our strategy was just PA and New Jersey, and then we, we built the team. We've had some success in Pennsylvania. Um, we got, got live in New Jersey, and then we, all these other star, states started to open up, and we wanted to focus on the growth aspect and try to get to market quickly in these states, um, and that's why we didn't, we didn't buy something, quite honestly, and, and, and found a partner that could help us scale and went that route instead. And as you look out on the, on the, and this is to both of you, but I'll start with you, as you look out on the uh, states uh, and the legalization process and the competitive process and the tax process, we heard uh, Senator Dabo talk about iGaming being the next most important thing for him in New York after this year when they uh, uh, introduced uh, the downstate licenses. W what's your outlook on the country for iGaming? <clears throat> Where do you see the opportunities? We, we would hope that it'd be a fast follow. I, you know, we're, not, we're not really seeing it yet, um, at least to be successful, but we would, we would certainly hope. I mean, let's be honest, that's where the, the real money is. Um, and you know, there is money to be made in sports betting, obviously, and it's spread across the country very, very rapidly. But we would hope that, that iGaming would, would soon follow, and hopefully some of these state legislatures will realize that you know, maybe the tax revenue that they were expecting from sports betting really isn't there for them, and um, maybe we should consider iGaming. Hopefully that's the case. Hopefully that happens. But it's not rolling out fast enough as far as we're concerned. John, do you think, uh, do you think that, where, where, where would you, how would you handicap this? Where, who do you think are the states uh, that you're watching that seem to have the best prospects over the next year or two? Well, for iGaming. Yeah, you, you mentioned New York, but I think that's... Uh, you know, it's a Hail Mary. I don't think that that's going to happen so quickly. Um, you know, anything to get casino uh, development or any, any bill across any table here in, in the state of New York is it's incredibly difficult. I've spoken personally many times with uh, Senator Adabo and Assemblymember uh, uh, Pretlow. Um, and yes, they're keen on it. Sports betting was a heavy lift. Digital sports betting or, or mobile sports betting took them quite a few years to accomplish. Um, but I have my eyes set more along the lines of the, uh, the Midwest. Uh, they were early adopters in sports betting. I'm talking about the states of Indiana, states of Iowa, uh, even Illinois to an extent, although there, there could be some complications there with the VGT routes. Um, and then you'll have your, your outliers or your, your randoms that'll you know, suddenly announce that they're going to legalize it. Um, Connecticut kind of came out of nowhere for me. Um, but then again, it's tribal, so that tribal element might actually, following on the footsteps of uh, states like 
uh, Michigan, uh, you might see more, some more momentum in those tribal states where they're actually willing to take that step. Uh, we, y yesterday, we, we heard uh, some very interesting conversation about uh, California, uh, sports betting, now, not, uh, not necessarily iGaming, uh, but um, you know, there's so much money and so much effort is going into getting it approved there, uh, but we, we heard uh, Richard Schutz say, you know, who's kind of an insider there, or used to be an insider there, uh, said, no chance. Now, uh, do you guys have a different point of view? Do you think it's going to be uh, uh, more likely to happen there? I mean, the lift that has to happen in order for sports betting to be legalized in the state of California is tremendous. There's going to be a referendum. Uh, I anticipate that uh, it will be, um, you know, voted in by by the constituents of, of the state of California. Um, but at the same time, I uh, I don't foresee even mobile um, uh, mobile sports wagering happening in the near term. It'll be a retail first rollout. Uh, at least that's what I believe. Uh, thereafter, with mobile at some point, um, perhaps next year, the year after, we, we could see you know movement on that. So for them to go full scale and uh, you know. Yeah, or at least eye gaming or legalized eye gaming, you've got to get the tribes in line. You've got, the, got to get the card rooms in line. You've got you got to bring the online only operators, such as you know fat, you know the big ones, uh, uh, FanDuel, DraftKings, who have you, uh, to all agree on something, and that's not an easy task to accomplish. But Matt, is that a focus for you? I mean, you absolutely. Think? Yeah. Um, but I spent a decade um, shepherding eye poker in California uh, and specifically in Sacramento. Richard remembers. Um, and it was, it was ugly, um, to say the least. Um, I think the operators that are there now doing what they're doing is very, very risky, um, trying to get out in front of the incumbent tribes. Um, it's not something that I would advise our company to do ever. But I think eventually it will happen. I hope it will happen. Um, it's just a matter of time and getting everybody on the same page. And it's probably, I think, very likely it's... The, the tribes are going to wade into this cautiously and probably start with retail like everyone, mm -hmm. everyone else thinks. And then online's just a tough one in California because they, they want to protect what they have, right. the land-based side. Do, the, do, the, uh, do you think the tribes in general, uh, since so many of the tribes around the country are in more remote locations, do you think they are more uh, wary of uh, all forms of digital gaming for that reason specifically? Possibly, but I, I think the ones that possibly believe in it see it as an opportunity for them because they are in those, in those areas where there aren't a lot of people. Right. The, the, the tribes are less monolithic because they're scattered around, if you will. They're independent, whereas the casino companies have all consolidated yeah. and speak with a, a more uh, uh, consistent voice. Let, let's flip, flip back over to platform strategy. Uh, and, John, could you tell us... You know, we heard yesterday, or maybe was it, yeah, sometime yesterday, we heard uh, a, a, a robust discussion of, of going it alone, or uh, as I think one of the panelists said, leaving it to the experts uh, who have the, the platforms. Um, was that, we, you already said that that was part of your discussion. How do you see that playing out uh, going forward? Do you see... Um, um, more uh, of this, uh, that being the better argument because of the expertise and the ability to, uh, you know, modify the platforms over time? I think, um, you know, just like, just as in statistical theory, uh, history repeats itself. Uh, if you look backwards uh, a decade or so, Europe saw the same phenomena. Uh, in the UK, uh, there were operators left and right who were uh, saying, the hell with it, excuse my language, um, but uh, I'm going to develop my own platform. I'm going to create a secret project, and I'm going to invest uh, 20, 30, 40 million dollars. And that's, again, 10 years back. Uh, and that kind of teetered out. Uh, by the end, uh, not only have they blown through their money, uh, they, they also went back to, to using uh, third-party platforms. Now, I'm not going to say that that, that is uh, correct for every single operator out there. You have companies which have very, very robust multi-state presences, um, and... I'll say that in, in, the, in the format of uh, internationally speaking. Um, companies who operate in complex and diverse markets like Australia, UK, the US, uh, Latin America, they could potentially, with size and scale, they could support that type of operation. But if you're just focused on the US and you're trying to have the best possible product, listen, I mean, us scaling across the US um, and with the company we have, again, 
7,000 or 6,000 plus employees, uh, half of those being tech, well, techies essentially. Uh, so let's say 3,000 techies on staff, um, you know, and we're going state by state, and it's, it's a very difficult lift. So if, forget about the third party, if I'm an operator with an in-house, uh, you know, dev team, um, I, maybe not 3,000, hopefully not 300 either, because I don't believe that's enough, um, and you're trying to scale as quickly as, as some people are, I think you're going to find yourself, again, stretched thin. And we haven't seen the peak of sports betting activity. I'm waiting to see what happens when, when you know, large events like the launch of New York State, for example, happen, where you see operators have downtime, um, or large-scale events, you know, the, the Super Bowl. You're going to see these things. You can look out for them. Uh, hopefully those with in-house platforms are able to sort that out, and, and third parties as well. The scaling factor, I think, it's limited to a very select few that are able to support that type of complex operation on a global scale. But, but how do you feel about, uh, as it gets into the more the technology issues and the scaling point we talked about before, the gaming product uh, is uh, evolving. And uh, I guess live betting is the most important thing. In Europe, I guess it's, what, 70 or 80 percent of the betting here. It's a much smaller number, but I would imagine the opportunities for betting on live are, are, are smaller here as well. For sports, yeah. not live dealer. Right, 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 for, for sports. How do, you, um, how do you see that is entering into your decision-making process, and where do you think that's going, you know, as an operator? How much more do you see the technology evolving? I mean, it's, it's, always evolving. I think for us, we're, we're, on, we're on the Canby platform uh, for sports, which is currently plugged into the, um, the Playtech IMS platform, which is the first of its kind, right, in, anywhere in the world yep. um, that Canby's done that with, with Playtech and vice versa. We, there's more that we would like to um, uh, get into the, the Canby system in terms of um, data feeds and, and other markets that we can offer, certainly from, from a live betting standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that's an area where I, I wish I had my own um, dev team and could really manage those timelines a little bit better um, and bring those things to market. But we haven't, we haven't seen the live betting flip from pre-match right. to, um, to live and, and the, that 80 to 20% you know, ratio that you spoke about mm -hmm. yet. But I think it's coming. Our live betting has been growing since we launched almost three years ago. Um, every month. In general, are you seeing, uh, John, uh, live betting increasing at a rate that you would expect based on what you saw in Europe? Over here in the here U.S.? Here in the U.S., yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I remember being back in Vegas, you know, again, I'll talk about a decade ago, but, uh, and uh, speaking about, um, you know, introducing live betting um, and, or in-play betting as some would call it, and everybody said, well, yeah, we've got these things called halftime prop lines or halftime lines, and basically you can bet on the rest of the match at halftime. And I said, all right, well, I'm looking over to Europe, and you can bet on the next pitch, what have you, it's going to be a strike, ball, et cetera. And they said, it's never going to fly here. So I think that, that that's a mistake. Uh, I would have invested earlier in that. And as you, as you come to see, you know, there's you know, supply, suppliers left and right who are uh, providing these supplementary products um, in one format or another, which really only specialize in in-play betting. Algorithm-derived or artificial, artificial intelligence-derived uh, um, odds creation is, is something that we've seen for a long time now, and companies are getting big multiples who are developing that type of technology. Uh, I guarantee we're going to hear news of, you know, one or, one or more uh, being scooped up or invested in uh, even you know, today or immediately after this conference. Not that I have any information on that, but... Those are companies that are their gems, and one of them is going to be, I won't call it a unicorn, but I'm sure one or a few are going to be uh, extremely lucrative. Uh, at the last panel, uh, David uh, asked his panelists about eSports. Is that something that you guys are paying a lot of attention to? Let's start with, with, uh, with John. So I was in a corporate development previously in, a, in another life, and we looked at a lot of eSports companies and, uh, that were trying to bridge the gap between gambling and uh, you know, esports as we, we've come to know them. And, you know, we were pretty close to, to making some investments, but we, we, that never, never happened, actually, to be frank. And reason being because we still we didn't manage to, to, you know, fully buy into the idea that that format of esports betting was going to work. Now, what I'm seeing now, um, you know, present day, 
if we take, for example, our live dealer product at Playtech, uh, we have a product which is you know, live slots. You can bet on slots as they're spin, or you, you can basically partake in a social uh, ex exercise where there's a slot reel in one of our slot games. And when uh, you know, a jackpot is hit, everybody wins. When the, there's no win, nobody wins. But the whole element here, you've got a kind of a, a broadcaster, a play-by-play -play commentator uh, in, this, you know, in a little bubble on the screen calling the shots, saying basically interacting with the, the, uh, the audience. Now, this really, and the first time I saw it coming from uh, our studios, is the first thought I had was this looks like eSports. Why? Because you've got this guy with a headset on calling, what's, calling out what's happening. You've got, a chat you've got a chat box there where everybody's commenting on what's happening and celebrating together. And then you've got, obviously, some, some animated uh, imagery, which is, which is occurring and, and causing winds to occur. So I do see sports coming. It will not, it, I highly doubt that it'll be in the format of a traditional sports book. Yes, there's bets placed through sports books on eSports events. But I think that an, a true millennial, true millennial, uh, anybody who's, who's into that type of thing, they're not really you know, inclined, especially uh, to bet on these, these these sportsbook apps. I think that we have to find a different experience. They need one their that unique. Just... They need their own format. Have Correct. you have you thought, spent much time thinking about this? Yeah, we have a lot, but we we definitely have integrity concerns with it. And that's why we we don't offer it. Got it. One quick question from the audience, Matt. How easy are you finding it to onboard new third-party casino suppliers? Pretty easy, um, depending on um, you know where they're based, and I think. Most of the suppliers that are coming over from Europe find the, the licensing process here a little daunting, but once they get over that hurdle, in terms of the integrations that we support with Playtech, it's been fairly easy and very straightforward. It's just slotting all those in because everything is so new. With, we're Playtech's first customer here, so there's a lot of stuff on the runway. Great. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It was a pleleasure Thanks. having you. Let's have a round of applause for our...